Chapter Six, Part One of the Boy Scout Aviators by George Durston. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Kangaroo. I hope he'll be all right," said Dick. "They'll find him, I'm sure," said Harry. "Even if they don't, he'll be all right for a few days, two or three, anyhow. A man can be very uncomfortable and miserable." And still not be in any danger. We don't need half as much food as we eat, really. I've heard that lots of times. They were riding along the line that Harry had marked on his map, and a mile or two ahead, there was visible an old-fashioned house, with a tower projecting from its center. From this, Harry had decided, they should be able to get the view they required and so locate the second heliographing station. How far away do you think it ought to be, Harry? asked Dick. It's very hard to tell, Dick. A first-class heliograph is visible for a very long way, if the conditions are right. That is, if the sun is out and the ground is level. In South Africa, for instance, or in Egypt, it would work for nearly a hundred miles, or maybe even more. But here, I should think, eight or ten miles would be the limit. And it's cloudy so often that it must be very uncertain. Why don't they use flags, then? The way we do in the scouts? Well, I guess that's because the heliograph is much more secret. You see, with the heliograph, the flashes are centered. You've got to be on almost a direct line with them, or not more than fifty yards off the center line to see them at all, even a mile away. But anyone can see flags and read messages, unless they're in code. And if these people are German spies, the code wouldn't help them. Having it discovered that they were sending messages at all would spoil their plans. I see. Of course, though. That's just what you said. It was really just by accident that we saw them flashing. Then they came to the house where they expected to make their observation. It was occupied by an old gentleman who came out to see what was wanted and stood behind the servant who opened the door. At the sight of their uniforms, he drew himself up very straight and saluted, but formal as he was, there was a smile in his eyes. Well, boys, he said, what can I do for you? On his majesty's service, I suppose. Yes, sir, said Dick. We would like to go up into your tower room, if you don't mind. Scouting, eh? said the old gentleman, mystified. Do you expect to locate the enemy's cavalry from my tower room? Well, well, up with you. You can do no harm. Dick was inclined to resent the old gentleman's failure to take them seriously, but Harry silenced his protest. As they went up the stairs, he whispered, It's better for them to think that. We don't want anyone to know what we're doing, you know. Not yet. So they reached the tower room, and just as Harry had anticipated, got a wonderful view of the surrounding country. They found that the heliograph they had left behind was working feverishly, and Harry took out a pencil and jotted down the symbols as they were flashed. It's in code, of course, he said, but maybe we'll find someone who can decipher it. I know they have experts for that. It might come in handy to know what they were talking about. There's the other station answering said Dick excitedly after a moment. Isn't it lucky that it's such a fine day, Harry? See, there it is, over there. Let me have the glasses, said Harry, taking the binoculars from Dick. Yes, you're right. They're on top of a hill, just about where I thought that we'd find them, too. Come on, we've got no time to waste. They're a good seven miles from here and we have a lot more to do yet. Below stairs, the old gentleman tried to stop them. 
He was very curious by this time, for he had been thinking about them, and it struck him that they were too much in earnest to simply be enjoying Lark. But Harry and Dick, while they met his questions politely, refused to enlighten him. "'I'm sorry, sir,' said Harry, when the old gentleman pressed him too hard. "'But I really think we mustn't tell you why we're here. "'But if you would like to hear of it later, "'we'll be glad to come and see you and explain everything.' "'Bless my soul,' said the old man. "'When I was a boy, we didn't think so much of ourselves, I can tell you. "'But then we didn't have any Boy Scouts either.' It was hard to tell from his manner whether that was intended for a compliment or not. But they waited no longer. In a trice they were on their motorcycles and off again. And when they drew near to the hilltop where the signals had come, Harry stopped. For a moment he looked puzzled. Then he smiled. I think I've got it, he said. They're clever enough to try to fool anyone who got on to their signaling. They would know what everyone would think, that they would be sending their messages to the East Coast, because that is nearest to Germany. That's why they're put their first station here. I'll bet they send the flashes zigzagging all around, but that will find they get to the East gradually. Now we'll circle around this one until we find out in what direction it's flashing. Then we'll know what line we must follow. After that, all we've got to do is to follow the line to some high hill or building, and we'll pick up the next station. Their eyes were more accustomed to the work now, and they wasted very little time. This time, just as Harry had guessed, the flashes were being sent due east judging from the first case that the next station would be less than ten miles away. He decided to ride straight on for about that distance. He had a road map and found that they could follow a straight line, except for one break. They did not go near the hilltop at all. I'd like to know what they're doing there, said Dick. So would I, but it's open country and they're probably keeping a close lookout. They're really safer doing that in the open than on a roof of a house out here in the country. Because they can hide the heliograph? It's portable, isn't it? They could stow it away in a minute, if they were alarmed. I fancy we'll find them using hilltops now as much as they can. Harry, I've just thought of something. If they've planned so carefully as this, wouldn't they be likely to have country places where they'd be less likely to be disturbed? Yes, they would. You're right, Dick. Especially as we get further and further away from London, I suppose there must be pl plenty of places a German could buy and lease. And perhaps people wouldn't even know they were German if they spoke good English and didn't have an accent. That suggestions of Dick's bore fruit, for the third station they found was evidently hidden away in a private park. It was in the outskirts of a little village, and Harry and Dick had no trouble at all in finding out all the villagers knew about the place. Twas taken a year ago by a rich American gentleman, with a sight of motor cars and foreign-looking servants, they were told. Very high and mighty he is, too. Does all his buying at the stores in London. And don't give local trade any of his patronage. The two scouts exchanged glances. Their suspicions were confirmed in a way. But it was being necessary to be sure. To be suspicious was not enough for them. We'll have to get inside, he said under another breath to Dick but the villager heard and laughed. Easy enough, if you're friends of his, he said. If not, look out, master. He's got signs up warning off trespassers, 
and traps and spring guns all over the place. Wants to be very private, and that he does. Thanks, said Harry. Perhaps we'd better not pay him a visit after all. End of chapter 6, part 1 Recording by Kangaroo